Okay, so um, first off, I would like to thank the organizers for providing me with this opportunity to present my research. Um, I'll be talking to you today about some applications of queuing theory and large division theory to models which are motivated by problems in biology. Okay? So one of the fundamental problems in biology is understanding how differences arise among individuals in a population. Uh, so these differences, which are called phenotypic differences, are generally attributed to either genetic or environmental causes. Okay? This is the familiar nature versus nurture debate. Uh, but recent research has shown that there are many instances in which both nature and nurture are more or less the same. Uh, there are not many genetic or environmental differences. And nevertheless, uh, the population shows heterogeneity. And this heterogeneity is often critical for the survival of this population. Okay? So the question is, how does this come about? And the answer that's emerging is that it's not nature, nurture, but there's a third element, chance or randomness. Okay? So that is what has motivated uh, increasing interest in stochastic models of cellular processes, and that will be the focus of this talk. So let me begin with some motivating examples. Uh, one of the textbook examples of um, uh, heterogeneity of outcomes in terms of uh, for an identical population is infection of bacteria by a virus called bacteriophage. Okay? Uh, so bacteriophage literally means bacteria killer. So in the 1940s, when the uh, Luria, Delbrook, Luria and Delbrook performed these experiments, uh, what was noticed was that when you infect, um, when we infect the bacterium with this virus, there are two outcomes. One is uh, lysis, in which the cell is ruptured, cell is killed, and the virus replicates and spreads to other cells. But the other one is where it becomes latent. It integrates into the genome. And this option is called lysogeny. So the cells are genetically identical, the bacteria are identical, uh, nevertheless the outcomes are different. Interestingly, uh, something similar seems to be happening also in HIV viral infections. So HIV virus integrates into the human genome, uh, again there are two outcomes. One is there can be active replication of the virus, so, and then this leads to cell lysis and a, uh, a virus spreads. But the other option, just like in this case, just as in this case, is when the virus integrates into the genome and becomes latent. Okay? So both options have uh, enormous uh, consequences uh, from a, a human health perspective. In the first case, when the virus uh, kills the immune cell and spreads, this is what gives rise to AIDS. Okay? But the other case is equally pernicious because what happens is that when the virus is in the active state and it's replicating, we know how to treat it. There's a cocktail of treatments, a therapeutic protocols, which are which basically kill the virus. But these don't affect the viruses that are in the latent state. So the problem is that if the therapy is discontinued, then um, the latent virus can, at future times, reactivate and start the whole process again. So you have to keep the therapy on for a long time, which is not sustainable. Okay. So this is currently the biggest problem. Um, the latency of the virus is currently the biggest problem in actually eradicating HIV. The question, then, sure. Correct. That is that is this. But I, I'm not familiar with the term seed bank. Yeah. Latency is the typical uh, term used here. And again, so so the question is, how does this arise? And uh, what Leo Weinberger's group has shown is that there's a critical protein called TAT, which is part of the viral uh, set of genes, uh, which has positive feedback in its expression. And the active replication state is correlated with a state in which you have high levels of this protein, which then with positive feedback maintain high levels. Whereas um, the case in which uh, the protein levels are low in the cell, it's attenuated, uh, this corresponds to latent infection. Okay? So in fact, going back to uh, yesterday's talk by Tony, you could think of these two as sort of metastable states, and you want to understand switching between these states. Okay? So that is the um, key question in the field. How can we control uh, switching between active and latent states? Because as you can imagine, uh, the therapy protocols take two options. You know, either you try to force all the cells to be latent and remain that way, or you sort of shock them all to be active and then get rid of them. Okay? So uh, controlling this, understanding the mechanisms is a critical uh, problem in the field. Remarkably, uh, something similar seems to be happening uh, in cancer as well. So one of the early observations was, for single cells was by Jeff Settlement's group. And what they observed was that the resistance of cancer cells to drugs was not readily be explainable by just mutations. 
Typically, we assume that you know cancer cell is resistant because it acquired mutations, but that happens further down the road. Okay, uh, what they observed was that they had a population of clonal cells; they were genetically identical, but there was a small fraction of these cells which were actually tolerant um, to the drug. Uh, so you put in the drug, then what happens? And this small fraction keeps changing. So individual cells transiently assume a drug tolerant phenotype. Okay, so at some point, these are the cells which are have drug tolerant. At a later point, there are different cells, but the fraction is kind of the same. So, uh, so when you add a drug, when you kill most of the sensitive cells, but the drug tolerant cells uh, survive, and they have the potential to repopulate the entire population. Okay, so again, uh, the question is, what are the molecular mechanisms that cause the individual cell in the population to switch to a drug tolerant phenotype? It gets worse uh, as recent studies in melanoma have shown. Um, so, uh, so this is somewhat. Uh, this is by. Uh, uh, I mean, the studies are by Arjun Raj group. This is a somewhat dramatic illustra illustration. So, if you have melanoma, skin cancer, then initially, if you treat, uh, you can get rid of most of the tumor cells. But there are these small fraction of rare cells which are resistant, and so you can see that the uh, cells are mostly tumor cells mostly gone. But now, what happens? is that if you continue to have sustained treatment by drugs, then these transient cells, which normally would go back to the normal state after some time, actually reprogram and become drug resistant over time. So, and, and then this is again the biggest problem in terms of uh, treating cancer, uh, the drug resistance that is induced. Okay? And so again, uh, this was studies done by Arjun Raj group very recently, a couple of months ago. And what they found was that the difference between the drug resistant state and the pre drug transient state is uh, in the gene expression of you know uh, several key genes basically uh, they quantified that and they found that even though this population um, uh, is mostly uh, susceptible few key cells which are different which are more likely to survive are the ones which have a gene expression profile that's similar to the uh, resistant case okay so these are now some clues that are emerging in terms of how this heterogeneity can arise. Uh, but what we would like to know is, you know, what are the rare events? Because these cells are rare. Uh, so what are the rare events that give rise to these pre-resistant cells? Okay. Um, so another clue emerges from some experiments done in Galit Lahav's group. Uh, basically, they looked at cases where if you put in a drug, you expect that to induce apoptosis in the cell. Okay. So there's a, a protein called P53, which is supposed to be the guardian of the cell, and uh, if there is adequate cell damage, then P53 directs uh, cell death or apoptosis. So they found that actually the cell-directed death can be fractional. I mean, not not all cells are killed, and there are some differences. And these differences arise because of levels of P53. It depends on levels of P53 in the single cells. So, so their conclusion was that there is some threshold which changes with time, um, almost linearly. And in, in the long time limit, if, if P53 levels are above the threshold, that leads to apoptosis. Okay? But if you have some uh, rare event where, say, most of the cells will have P53 levels above the threshold, and you have apoptosis, but some cells are below the threshold, then you do not induce apoptosis. Okay? So, uh, so, so the key point here is that it's the rate of accumulation uh, of uh, a particular protein that determines apoptosis at the single cell level. Okay? And uh, uh, we would like to maybe look at rare events in terms of the rate being far away from its mean value. Uh, so that's uh, one takeaway from this. And they found that they could, if they could play around with uh, increasing the uh, uh, activation or reducing the threshold, they could sort of get rid of all these cells. Uh, but, but the main point is we would like to understand the processes that give rise to this. OK, so let's take stock. So what we have in all these cases, and in fact many more, even there are bacterial analogs, uh, is we have a population of genetically identical cells, okay, uh, which are in many homogeneous environment. Uh, nature and nurture are the same. It's an environment designed to kill them all. Uh, nevertheless, they survive because they are phenotypically heterogeneous. And this heterogeneity arises because individual cells in the population undergo probabilistic self-fate decisions, okay? And these self-fate decisions, 
enable survival of the population on the whole. These are not related to any genetic differences. All the studies have shown it. So what is the cause? What is the underlying source? And the answer that's emerging is that this heterogeneity is driven by the underlying randomness of cellular process itself. Okay? Uh, in particular, so fluctuations enable these uh, probabilities of self decisions. And in particular, as we've seen in all the examples so far, it seems to be that there are rare events or large fluctuations in the process of gene expression uh, that drives variations in isogenic cells. Okay? So that's the motivation for the work I'll be presenting today. We want to understand um, at various levels uh, stochastic models of gene expression uh, to then understand how heterogeneity can arise. Okay. So how do we go about modeling gene expression? Um, at the simplest level, you can think of gene expression as a two-stage process. Uh, the process of transcription, which gives rise to production of mRNAs from the information encoded in the DNA, and then the process of translation, which produces proteins uh, from every mRNA. Of course, each of these molecules, mRNAs and proteins, can be degraded. So if you were to model this, the simplest model that you can write down is depicted here. You model each of the steps as a Poisson process. So you have um, production of mRNA occurring with a constant rate Km. Each mRNA degrades with a constant rate gamma M. Uh, each mRNA can give rise to proteins with a constant rate Kp. And each protein degrades with a constant rate gamma P. Okay? So this is the quite possibly the simplest model of gene expression. Um, it's called the two-stage model because you have two stages here. And what is remarkable is that even this simple model actually captures uh, many of the features that are now observed by experiments in, at, at a single cell level. Okay? So this is often used for fitting um, uh, data as well. And as we'll see, there are, of course, deviations from this. What is also remarkable is that although this model is very simple, you can obtain the moments of uh, mRNA and protein distributions very easily, uh, for a long time, possibly the quantity that was of greatest interest, which is understanding the time-dependent and steady-state distribution of proteins, there were no analytical expressions for this, at least for the corresponding uh, generating function. Okay? So even though this model is very simple, um, it was hard to find the exact expressions uh, that we would like to have. So that's one problem when it comes to modeling gene expression, uh, uh, that even the simplest models seem to be somewhat intractable when it comes to exact analytic solutions uh, for the distributions, characterizing the distributions. Okay. Right, right. So this is a much simpler model. There are models which have two stages, where the messenger RNA has to go from the nucleus to the cytoplasm, so there will be two steps to this, right? So you, that, those will be extensions. But here it's assuming that, you know, at the simplest level, you're assuming that there's just one rate-limiting step, and, you know, that corresponds to, uh, you know, uh, production of proteins. But I'm going to come to this point exactly. Okay, so that's precisely my next slide. So, um, so you have, um, so the, so one problem is we don't know how to solve things exactly. The second problem is that this is what physicists tend to write. They write down simple models of gene expression. And coming back to your point, this is what biologists will write when they like uh, simple models of gene expression. So there are multiple steps that are involved. And clearly, as was pointed out, you cannot really replace all these steps by a single rate. Okay? So, uh, so you, would have, you would like to be able to expand, extend uh, the models to be, to be able to incorporate the complexity that we know exists in biological processes. Okay. So, yes? Questions that you're going to ask? Yeah, it will be Markov process. But although I will... So then there won't be a steady state. So no, because there will be a steady state. Because there the... Two absorbing states. No, where are the, the, because the DNA is constantly producing a, a, a mRNA, so there is no absorbing state. The DNA is always present in the cell, it's... Uh, okay, maybe right? maybe. okay, you'll see. Uh, okay, so, uh, so wait. Okay, so that's, uh, so we need to have models which take into account the complexity of observed cellular processes. Uh, so, another, uh, so one of the observed complexities is that when you actually observe gene expression, you see that it occurs in bursts. So you have a long periods where there is no activity at all, and then suddenly you have activity where you have produced a burst of mRNAs. Okay? And then again, long periods of inactivity, that's experimentally observed. 
So to accommodate that, uh, people introduced this three-stage model. So we just like the two-stage model, except that the promoter, which controls how genes are to be expressed, can toggle between active and repressed states. Okay? So for when it's repressed, there's no expression, and then switch back to active, it can produce mRNAs. So, um, so with this simple model, you can see that mRNA burst distribution is predicted to be a geometric distribution okay, in the limit in which uh, these rates are large compared to uh, the on rate, K on. And furthermore, even at the translational level, you see that in the limit in which protein lifetimes are small compared to mRNA lifetimes, each mRNA gives rise to a burst of proteins. Uh, and these bursts are also geometrically distributed. Okay? So the point here is that you need to take into account burst uh, when you build the models. And furthermore, um, when experiments are actually measured, the time interval between arrival of these bursts, these are not single, sim in many cases, they are not simple exponential distributions. Okay? So it's not a single rate, as was pointed out. And you need to have more general waiting time distributions. Okay? So these are some of the complexities that we need to include. Okay, so that sets up the stage for the questions that motivated the research I'm going to propose, show. At the first level, you want to understand, you know, for simple coarse grained models, which, you know, seem to nevertheless work for a variety of examples, how do you obtain exact generating functions? Okay. Uh, then at the next level, we want to include the complexities that have been observed, which is bursting and then promoter-based regulation. The promoter can regulate uh, the arrival process. So how to take this into account and how to understand uh, how these processes can be used to control fluctuations in gene expression, okay? And finally, we want to consider even more general class of stochastic models. And for these models, we'd like to then quantify the probability of rare events and get the driven model, which I'll explain, okay? Okay, so let me begin with this. Okay, so let me start by the observation uh, that again, for the uh, Simple two-stage model, this is just production of mRNAs, which occurs with the pause of process. And each mRNA degrades with, again, constant rate, okay? So uh, the evolution of uh, this is governed by the master equation, and you now we can look at the corresponding generating function. So it's straightforward to uh, write down the master equation and solve it for the steady state, and you obtain a steady state distribution, which is a pause or distribution, okay? So at the mRNA level, it's straightforward to obtain the distributions. If you take the three-stage model, it's a little bit involved, but again, it's straightforward. Uh, you can take the three-stage model where the DNA goes from active and active stages, uh, and then you have the remainder the same as two-stage model. And in this case, the steady state generating function uh, is the uh, confluent hypergeometric function, okay? Okay, so these, this is already known, yes? So the DNA is either active or inactive. So uh, that means the configuration of the DNA can change. Uh, depend, that's called chromatin, basically. If you have a close configuration, then polymerase cannot access the promoter. It cannot produce. So you have to wait till it becomes open again in order to uh, produce transcripts. Okay. How does change work? So that's that's what in fact much more complicated than that. But uh, uh, I mean, in the model, the constant rates. Okay, but but you will we'll see much more complex models. Okay. Well, both we can look at both. Yeah. So right now I'm talking about messenger RNA. So first of all, both are experimentally measured quantities. Uh, you can sort of use them to understand what's happening at the process. Okay, uh, underlying process. So people can measure mRNA distributions. They can also measure protein distributions. And we would like. Well, I'll come to that. I'll come to that. So, so the so so if I just look at them, because the fact that the mRNA gives rise to protein does not affect the mRNA. Why is mu m is the degradation rate of the mRNA. So, when the mRNA gives rise to protein, the mRNA does not degrade. It's not mRNA transfers into protein. The mRNA stays where it is, and the protein is created from the mRNA. Okay, the ribosome goes along the mRNA, produces a protein, but the mRNA stays. Well, because the MRI can also be degraded independently, independent of the degradation rate. Correct. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Second 
Uh, no, because this this. Well, it's if in in the limit of fast switching, what you're saying is correct, but in the limit of slow switching, that's not correct. Okay. Both are exponential. What are exponential? I mean, like the rate. The rate. Yeah, there are rates. Yeah, yeah. But but you can see that uh, you know, especially if you take the limit of very slow switching, then you can see actually there'll be two there'll be bimodal this right in one part you'll be having this so it's uh, so we just take this as uh, C F C forward C backward yeah yeah out here okay yeah, yeah, okay okay but okay so the, the sorry the point I wanted to make was that um, um, we know how to get mRNA distributions but the protein distributions which are of interest again as you pointed out. Um, we don't know how to get, even for the two-stage model, if you go beyond uh, this, the proteins. So wouldn't it be great if we could somehow obtain the protein distributions from the mRNA distributions? Okay? So I'm going to show you a trick by which we can do this. So here's the basic idea. Um, uh, so you have the process which corresponds to arrival of mRNAs. I can show you the master equation that I can split this into n independent identical processes, where each mRNA, type of mRNA arrives with rate k by n, okay? Um, and then I can take the limit. So this is just an arbitrary decomposition that I've done. You know, writing the, uh, decomposing the process to n independent identical processes. I can take the limit n goes to infinity. So if I go take the limit n goes to infinity, then for any finite time, starting with zero mRNAs, I can ignore the possibility of more than one mRNA arrivals, okay, for any time, because I've taken the limit n goes to infinity. So this model then maps on to n independent identical models, each of which the arrival rate is actually k by n, okay. And this again is very straightforward to solve. Uh, you now the number of arrivals here, number of ones here, are going to be uh, uh, binomially distributed in the limit of large n that maps on to Poser distribution, which is exactly what we obtain, okay. So that is straightforward. But now let's see what happens if I take the model for proteins and carry out the same trick. If I replace this by identical models, then what we get is that if you recognize this, this is actually the model for the three-stage model for mRNAs. So somehow the two-stage model for proteins can be seen as a can be seen as arising from n, n identical copies of three stage models of mRNAs in the limit that n goes to infinity, okay? So let me show it more generally. So the basic idea is you take the incoming POSA process, arrival process, and partition it into n independent identical processes, okay? So you label each mRNA as one of n types with probability one by n, and that results in taking um, the original model, splitting it up into n independent identical reduced models, and so for the two-stage model, the reduced model is in fact identical to the three-stage model for an mRNA. So if I know the solution of this, I can get a solution of the original model, okay? And so that indeed is the case. So we can then uh, um, uh, obtain the steady state We know for the mRNAs, the steady state distribution is the Kummer function that I mentioned earlier. So for the proteins, the corresponding exact result for the steady state distribution is in fact given by limit as n goes to infinity of exponential n times this Kummer function, okay? So this is indeed the exact result, and um, uh, we obtained this just using previously obtained, uh, previously known results. Uh, this was first obtained by Bokes et al., uh, and we obtained it using this argument. But furthermore, we could go beyond and also get the time-dependent distribution of uh, mRNA, joint distribution of mRNAs and proteins, okay? So this is the quantity that is of great interest. And once again, you can show using this mapping the equation satisfied by the uh, joint distribution for the reduced model, and ultimately we get the exact expression for the joint distribution, for the generating function of the joint distribution of mRNA and the proteins uh, for the two-stage model of gene expression, okay? Because this time-dependent probability can be obtained, and so you can plug it in, and this is uh, exact, okay? Um, uh, so I'll just make one more point before I go ahead, um, because I want to go on to the large deviation aspects. Uh, you can generalize this. So whenever the arrival process is a pause process, you can use this trick of partitioning it into n types and then taking the limit n goes to infinity. Uh, you can generalize it to the cases that we discussed where mRNA doesn't directly create proteins but undergoes some post-transcriptional regulation, transport, let's say, uh, and so the multi-step 
involved. So all of these models can be analyzed with this trick. And what it does is that it maps a model of post-transcription regression of proteins to a promoter-based regulation model of mRNAs. Okay? And we know how to solve these, so we can, using this solution, you can also get solution for, uh, at least for the moment, for uh, post-transcription regulation of proteins. Okay? So it's a nice mapping, basically. Well, Z is the generating function, argument of the generating function. So, you know. Well, well, the, well, the G will have N inside it. So, because, because you, yeah, the G will have N inside it. So, so N is actually just a parameter that I've introduced by hand. Okay? Uh, it's, it's completely fictitious. So, it will not affect the final result at all. So, what happens is that the G has Km by N inside it. Okay, so in the limit, when you take the limit, you can get a result which is completely independent of n. It's just a fictitious parameter that helps you go from a original model to a reduced model, which is more tractable. Okay, um, okay, so I want to maybe go a little bit quicker here. Um, so, so now we want to look at the second part, which is how do you um, take into account bursting and promoter-based regulation? Uh, and so what we realized was queuing theory forms provides a very natural. Um, um, analytical framework for analyzing these problems, okay? So I'll skip over, I'm assuming most of the audience is already familiar with queuing theory. It's the mathematical theory of waiting lines, and the problem you have is customers can arrive according to a stochastic process, stay in service for some random time, and then leave the system. And you would like to know sort of how many servers are gonna be occupied at any given time. This is some of the problems that queuing theory deals with. And the basic insight is that we can also use this to model stochastic arrival and departure of cellular macromolecules, such as proteins or mRNAs. Okay. So, so here's a general model now, where uh, you can, instead of having an exponential waiting time distribution, we assume that there's an arbitrary waiting time distribution between arrival of mRNA bursts, and the bursts can have arbitrary distribution, each mRNA produces protein, and then the departure also is not just a process, but can have a general waiting time distribution. Okay. So, um, at the mRNA level, it's straightforward I mean, to, to address this. At the protein level also, using the burst, bursty synthesis approximation, I can map it onto a model where you have arrival of proteins with some waiting time distribution, a burst, and then uh, the departure of proteins. Okay. So the, the, the mapping is basically, if it, at the protein level, uh, proteins are the analogs of customers in the queue. And the steady state protein number is steady state number of customers you know, waiting for service. Uh, when you have bursty synthesis of proteins, that is like batch arrivals of customers. And then the uh, lifetime is the customer service time. And furthermore, we're interested in models in which proteins are degraded independently, and so uh, that corresponds to having an infinite server queue. Okay. Okay, so, so in particular, the model that I showed maps onto a GIXG infinity queue which was first studied by Liu et al. And we looked at two specific examples. So we used the formalism here to look at two specific examples, um, a GIX M infinity queue, uh, which is, which Johan Paulson has termed gestation effect, because the arrival process is arbitrary. And also the, um, uh, the other case in which the arrival process is Markovian and the departure can be a general distribution. Okay. So, uh, so basically, let me just summarize the main results. Um, what we find is that um, we can quantify exactly the noise, that is the variance of the steady protein steady state distribution divided by the mean squared. Okay? This can be related to the underlying processes. So the transcriptions that come from transcriptional bursting, from translational bursting, and also from the waiting time distribution of arrivals. How each of these contributes actually can be uh, exactly obtained using the tools of queuing theory and uh, so one interesting thing that we see is that arrival waiting time distribution contributes additively to the overall noise, whereas for the departure, you actually have a factor, scaling factor that multiplies this noise term. So, so there are different ways in which uh, both transcriptional and post translational regulation affect the noise in gene expression. You can use this to tune, okay? Uh, the only point, yes. Yeah, so this was somewhat misleading because I have an infinite server queue. So each customer as it arrives just stands in front of the server. A new customer is not going to stand in line, it's going to go to another server. 
So it's an infinite server queue. OK, so um, yeah. So, so the point here is that for any general scheme, I can calculate the waiting time distributions and use these results to then obtain the noise at the level of the mean and the variance of protein distributions. Okay? But now finally, I want to look at uh, rare events, large deviations. Okay? So let me begin with some motivation. So again, uh, you're all aware of the striking observation that you know, the DNA in each of our cells is the same. But your typical liver cell or skin cell is going to be very different from your neuronal cell. Okay? So why are there these differences? And the answer lies in the fact that um, you are expressing a different complement of the overall set of proteins and mRNAs that you have in your cell. And that is not because of genetic differences, but epigenetic differences. Okay? So the DNA is the same in every cell, but the modifications are different. And what these modifications do is that they change the rate at which proteins are output. Okay? In some cases, some genes are completely silenced, so they don't produce proteins at all in one tissue type, but they are expressed in some other tissue type. So these epigenetic modifications, factors which make these epigenetic modifications, alter gene expression profiles. And these are also correlated with rare events that lead to phenotypic switching in cancer and also especially in cancer. So this is now a hot topic of current research because people are understanding. This is a, a science paper that came out last year, which looks at the dynamics of epigenetic regulation at a single cell level. Okay? Uh, so you want to understand how these epigenetic changes which alter the promoter transition rates impact rare events. Okay? So more broadly, we want to understand a mathematical framework by which for general promoter models. So this is an example of one of the promoter models. right? So, uh, so there are multiple internal states which you can transition to, and each state has a different production rate of mRNAs. So you would like to be able to look at large deviations in such models. Okay. okay. So once again, uh, we use some of the tools from queuing theory. Uh, so here's our general model for um, gene expression. Uh, we model it as a batch Markovian arrival process. So it's illustrated out here. You have n promoter states where n can be arbitrary, and you can have arbitrary transitions between each of the promoter states. These rates alpha ij. Alpha ij refers to the rate of going from i to j. So, um, 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 and then when you are in each uh, promoter state, you can give rise to a burst of mRNAs or proteins. Um, and with arbitrary burst distribution, BIM. Okay? And what we're interested in is the probability of activity fluctuation. So the rate of mRNA production uh, in the long time limit. Okay? Well, what is this? Uh, because as we've seen in previous examples, uh, these rare events correspond to rates that differ from the mean significantly can give rise to different outcomes. Okay? So we want to quantify this. So uh, I should be. Uh, uh, so the rate for mRNA production satisfies the large division principle. Okay, so we are interested in this rate function, and uh, as you know, uh, we'll see in several uh, lectures here, we can obtain the large division function uh, uh, by invoking the uh, gartner ellis theorem by looking at a scaled cumulant generating function. Okay, so so I apologize. There's a uh, small error here. This should be. Uh, the, the term in brackets should be m times t. Okay? So if m is a random variable corresponding to the number of mRNAs that arrive up to time t, then the rate, small m, is the rate. So, okay? so, so there should be a factor of uh, t right here. Okay. So the scaled uh, cumulant generating function, when it exists and is differentiable, is going to be, uh, we can obtain the rate function from the Legendre Fincher transform of the scale cumulative generating function okay, uh, using the Gartner Ellis theorem. So I just want to note that um, this is the, basically the analog of the partition function in the canonical ensemble, okay, where lambda is like a beta, the inverse temperature. M, M, the capital M, is like the total energy. Okay? Uh, and, but now you're looking at paths. You're looking at uh, paths of time t. In the, so the extensive parameter here is t. The large parameter is t instead of n uh, in thermodynamics. Okay? And so the scale cumulative generating function is like the analog of the free energy. Okay. So we'd like to obtain the scale cumulative generating function. And so 
so that's uh, straightforward to write down the master equation uh, in terms of these D matrices. And basically the D matrices quantify um, the D0 matrix encodes the rates of transition without any production events. So just the transitions without any production, whereas the for our model, the D n greater than one matrices are diagonal matrices which correspond to production of mRNAs. Okay? So this will correspond to arrival of n mRNAs or n proteins. Okay? So if I now write, write on the dynamics of the model, then the generator basically looks like this. I have infinite dimensional phase space because I specify the state phases i which is the promoter state and then m the total number of mRNAs produced up to time t. So this can go from 0 to infinity and this is a uh, n dimensional, uh, i can go from 1, one to n. So, so, so this is what the generator looks like uh, where the diagonal elements are the ones which correspond to no changes in the mRNAs whereas uh, d1 corresponds to addition of one mRNA. So we know from large division theory that uh, in order to obtain the scale cumulative generating function, you have to consider a twisted generator. Okay? That basically gives you the time evolution of this quantity out here, the generating function out here. You can obtain the time evolution of the generating function by considering the twisted generator. And uh, uh, so the twisted generator in this case is the following. The D0 matrix is unchanged. And whenever you have an arrival of n uh, molecules, you add a factor of e to the power minus lambda n. Okay? So once you have the twisted generator, then the dominant eigenvalue of this, so we are working in the limit in which uh, the matrices are reducible. Okay? Because that's the assumption. So, um, so once you have the dominant uh, eigenvalue corresponds to the scale cumulative generating function. So in this particular case, for this twisted generator, what we can show is that there's an n by n matrix which corresponds to adding up all the dn matrices, twisted dn matrices. And this matrix, the dominant eigenvalue, the largest eigenvalue of this, uh, is basically the uh, scale cumulative generating function, okay? negative of the scale cumulative generating function. So effectively what we have is we have, uh, for arbitrary promoter model, we can construct uh, n by n matrix, which the dominant eigenvalue of which gives you the scale cumulative generating function for general promoter models. Okay? So you can use that to get the rate function either analytically or numerically. But more importantly, we can also use it to get something which is called a driven model. So you will hear about that in uh, Yugo Tushet's talk, I'm sure. Uh, this is something that they introduced where um, if we take a original Markovian model, okay, and we look at a rare event in the arrival rate, so some m which is arbitrary, different from mean, then if we want to condition on the arrival rate being uh, some quantity m, which is different from the, mean, uh, from the mean expected arrival rate, then conditioning on that uh, is kind of like focusing on the microcanonical ensemble. Uh, so you would like to obtain a Markovian process, which is conditioning free, which has the same statistics as the original process conditioned on the rare event. Okay? And that can be done by using the left eigenvector uh, for this uh, dominant eigenvalue. Okay? So this is a generalization of the dupe transform. And uh, uh, so we can, again, in this case, uh, apply the formalism to actually obtain uh, the driven model. Okay? So, yeah, sorry. So in particular, if Li is the left eigenvector corresponding to this uh, matrix D lambda, then what we obtain are the parameters for the driven model. And it turns out that in this case, the driven model is also a batch Markovian arrival process. Okay? Um, it's, uh, uh, this, this is how the, each of the rates are changed. This is how the transcription rate is changed. And this is how the burst distribution is changed. So the driven model basically quantifies the most likely way in which a rare event okay, in activity occurs. And so with these results, you can actually figure out how much of it is based on transcription changes, how much of it is based on translational changes. You can look at the shape of the fluctuation uh, given the parameters. Okay? So this is, uh, again, exact. And we can now use this to look at um, uh, multiple models. So if you look at the simplest model, uh, where you have geometrically distributed bursts of mRNAs of proteins arriving, then we can obtain the uh, uh, 
the rate function and we see that bursting, if I take two models with the same means, then if I have bursting, increased bursting makes it much more likely to have rare events, either at the low end or also at the high activity end. Okay, so that's one impact of bursting. Uh, another very interesting thing that we see is that, you know, if you take the two-state model, simple two-state model, then we can obtain the scale cumulative generating function, and in the limit that this rate goes to zero, we actually see that it shows a kink, which is a signature of a dynamical phase transition. Okay? This is also the limit in which the dynamics becomes reducible, so, um, uh, so uh, we cannot be yeah. And finally, we can look at the uh, rate function, and we see that for this model, again, uh, in the limit beta goes to zero, above a critical value, the fluctuations are more or less, uh, basically driven by the Poisson process. But as you go below the critical value, where the function becomes non-analytic, you see deviations from the Poisson distribution. Okay? So again, uh, you, you, these dynamical phase transitions can change the rate at which uh, the rate event happens. Okay, so I just, um, uh, so again, we can get this um, driven models, and uh, we are con interested in looking at the conditions that give rise to this dynamical phase transitions in stochastic models of gene expression. So let me conclude with a summary. Um, so I showed you how partitioning of Poisson arrivals leads to tractable stochastic models. Uh, mapping to QN theory leads to exact moments for general arrival time distributions. And finally, uh, we've obtained uh, analytical results for large deviations in activity fluctuations for a very general class of models. And this can be used to analyze how epigenetic um, changes control rare events in gene expression. Um, I mean, conclude with the acknowledgments. So the uh, large division work was done largely in collaboration with Jordan Horowitz, and the earlier work was done in collaboration with uh, Neeraj Kumar and Thierry Platini. Uh, thank you for your attention, and I'll be happy to take any questions you have. In the first part of your talk, yeah. uh, you had this uh, model of protein production, and then you, you made this alternative model where you had this n q's. Yes. You derive this partial differential equation for the moment generating function. Yeah. But can you, can you just derive such a differential equation for the original model as well? Is for which model? For the original model without considering this. You, you, can, you can write it down, but the point is you cannot, uh, it's hard to solve it exactly. So this is easier to solve than? Uh... This is much easier to solve, yes. So, so, so this model, I mean, for the original model, you have to write down the uh, equation for the joint distribution of mRNAs and proteins. Yes. Right? Whereas here, you only have one variable here, just the mRNA, right? So this is right. certainly easier to solve. And you can see here already that the solution is fairly complex, right? You have yeah. the generating function is exponential of a Kummer function with, with again, in the limit n goes to infinity. So, uh, so it, it, this is just an easier way of doing it. Uh, but you're right. I mean, this is a linear model, so it's tractable. You can get all the moments. Just the closed form expression for the generating function is easier, I think, using this.